Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares webcast series supporting family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified dementia care consultant, and founder of McGill University's Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee our program, who include Dr. José Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Dr. Serge Gauthier, Professor Emeritus, formerly of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of donors, and I would like to thank the Zeller Family Foundation for sponsoring today's webcast. Today's topic will be anticipatory grief, as it's very common for people who are caring for a person with dementia, but it also applies to our life in general. I would like to welcome Corey Sirota, my friend and colleague, who was one of our first guests when we launched McGill Cares in May of 2020. Corey is a clinical social worker and sessional lecturer at the McGill School of Social Work, who specializes in loss, bereavement, and stress management. She is also the co-host of the weekly radio show, Life Unrehearsed on CJAD, and the author of Someone Died, Now What? A Personal and Professional Perspective on Coping with Loss and Grief. Welcome to McGill Cares, Corey. Thanks so much, Claire, for having me. So, you know, before we get into the whole concept of anticipatory grief, perhaps you can explain the difference between grief and mourning, as I really feel that it doesn't necessarily have to apply to a person, right? It could be, it could apply to ourselves, it could apply to like a loss with something that, you know, we can no longer do. So maybe we can get and start with that. Absolutely. A lot of people interchange the terms grief and mourning, and that's fine. Um, what I like to do is help people understand that mourning is the cultural norms that a society, uh, the act of grieving, whereas grief is the emotional piece of mourning. So when we look at that, of course, as you said, there are many people who grieve all sorts of things. It's so I call it non-death losses that, that have happened and occur whether it's prior to a death or during a terminal illness or just in life in general. I, I have this philosophy that everything relates to loss. So loss can be uh, an, an unwelcome change that happens in someone's life, like um, uh, they're no longer married. A divorce can be a mm -hmm. loss, a uh, loss of use of something. As we age, we lose all kinds of uh, capabilities, uh, some are, are less significant, but some can be really devastating when you're no longer able to play a sport because unfortunately our bones or our bodies just don't let us or loss of now I need glasses. I can't you know, so it's loss of my perfect eyesight. So there's many, many, many things that are related to loss. And when we think about that in that context, perhaps we can be a little kinder to ourselves and not feel we're going to feel badly, but we're going to hopefully understand that this is something that is why it's so difficult for us to accept those changes. So I guess it's really part of the whole evolution of aging. I mean, we are just going through this evolution of life. And as we age, we have to, it's a process that inevitably we will all have to face, right? Like whether it's ourselves or, you know, it, it could also be, you know, I, I see a lot of people when they approach retirement age, you know, grieving the fact that they're no longer have this career or being able to go to the office as much, right? So, um, you know, and, and, and it's interesting that, you know, I think, we, we, we see the term as grief and mourning and we think right away of death, but it isn't necessarily only that, right? So it's the way you said, it's just this, this evolution of life that we're going through, right? So what is anticipatory grief? So uh, the term is used, it was probably coined by Ken Doka many, many years ago. And it's, a, it's, a, it's the process of grieving, but prior to someone dying. So it's the feelings that someone has, and it looks and feels a lot like grief, but no one has died. So people think maybe they're going crazy because why am I feeling this way? There hasn't been a death, but it's about the experience that the person themselves who may be diagnosed with something or has had this transition and the family or friends sur surrounding them are going to experience this because it can begin as soon as diagnosis, as soon as there's been a change, a transition. And I like to say the unwelcome change or transition, 
we're going to start to grieve that. So like when I use dementia as an example, you know, and it could also be another type of really, you know, very serious illness. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, I guess it's in the moment that you're in the doctor's office where this, I call it the shock factor sets in, right? And you, you receive this news that you know is going to permanently interrupt your life, right? Mm-hmm. That the way, the way life that you knew it isn't going to be the way it's going to become. So I guess the grieving process begins from that, the moment that you receive that news. Well, that's exactly it, Claire. So it's the uniqueness of anticipatory grief is that it starts, it can start as soon as someone gets a diagnosis and then whether it's the person and or the family that is experiencing all of these emotions. And I want to add that it's not just the emotional piece. It can be spiritually, it can be cognitively, it can be physically. So it affects us holistically. And to be aware of that, so you don't like, why am I all of a sudden, um, I can't stop ruminating about this experience or I, I believed strongly and now I do not, I'm not a strong, my belief in, in whatever religion you follow, people turn to and people turn away in ter- times of crisis. And, and because of their, their ability or, or difficulty in processing what they've heard. So understanding that uh, the feelings for sure are a big one and there's a lot of discussion around um, the process of grieving and Elizabeth Cooper Ross is a pioneer in the field and I actually don't use her theory around death. I use her theory and will quote it around the dying process because that's what she really wrote the or process um, created that theory for was was the how does a bereaved person someone who has a change how are they processing it first there's denial then there's Mm -hmm. anger then there's bargaining then there's depression or sadness and then she talks about or a lot of theories talk about acceptance i like to use the word actually adaptation because i think that's what we really need to do is we need to come to a point where we adapt to whatever the uh, diagnosis is or the circumstances are I was just about to ask you, you answer my question, because what are what are the symptoms of grief? Like, uh, for, uh, you know, I'll say that for years I was in a state of anger, you know, over my mother's diagnosis and the impact that this illness had, you know, on me and my life and my families. And I spent so many years so incredibly angry, um, but never really recognizing that that was how I was coping with grief. So what are some of the symptoms that people may be going through right now and not realizing maybe they are actually grieving? So I always say feelings aren't right or wrong. They just are. And anything where a grief, anticipatory or t- or post-death grief is as unique as you are. So everyone's going to feel it and experience it differently. And that's where I get, I don't like to use theories because people love to check boxes. So you look at the theory, you say, wait a sec, I wasn't angry or I'm only angry. I never got sad or I didn't bargain. I didn't want to say, well, if I do this or so not to get hung up on that, but to know that probably every type of emotion and physical reaction is normal. It, it's how it's how you go back to how do you cope with any kind of adversity and that's going to give you a clue as to how you're going to handle or you might handle this experience that you're going through and i want to go back to the fact that grief uh, or anticipatory grief is very unique in that when someone dies you're grieving that death when you get this diagnosis the person themselves has a reaction to that so they there's that anticipatory grief comes both from the person who's going to have a host of feelings and and emotions about it and from the family and that like we said it starts a diagnosis but the anticipatory grief ironically ends at the point of death because there's no more anticipation anymore we know what's happened but knowing that one when you when someone starts to grieve a change in their lives that is going to get intensified as they get closer to perhaps the death of someone the for the person and for the uh loving family members whereas with death when somebody grieves they they grieve immensely at the beginning and hopefully but not always it changes it, it's messy and it's complicated but it will dissipate whereas if you understand what i'm saying it's going to get more mm-hmm. intense when somebody is 
uh, experiencing anticipatory grief. So are there, you know, certain uh, patterns or certain classics, you know, evolutions of a person who um, is diagnosed with a terminal illness, the way they experience anticipatory grief, as well as the certain experiences that loved ones face? Like, how, like what have you seen in your practice? You no, know, it's a great question. I think that there's some pieces that are absolutely unique, uh, uh, similar for both the person who's received any kind of diagnosis and for the family. Um, and then there's some pieces that are are different depending on, again, always personalities are different and how people cope are different. But for the person, they may be in denial. Um, mm -hmm. So I said, and, and so for family members, they can be in denial. I my, It is my hope that at some point, and please don't hear this the wrong way as people are listening to this, there is a bit of a gift in getting the diagnosis only in that when it's a sudden death, you have no preparatory time to grieve. You have no opportunity to make any plans. You have no time to uh, settle things, say things that might otherwise go unsaid. So I recognize that it is not a, it's never a gift to be given a diagnosis or any kind of change that one doesn't want is not um, healthy and, and, and it's scary quite frankly. And mm -hmm. that said, if the opportunity to take this diagnosis and situation and really consider having those tough discussions, making those really necessary plans and for the person themselves, saying how it is they want to live out their final days, months, years, I, you know, depending on their condition, and for the family to know and not guess and to honor those wishes and know where papers are, know where um, their wishes in terms of uh, funeral arrangements, know what what they can do to make the best of the time that they have left. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the concept of anticipatory grief um, with regards to dementia is, is a difficult one because as a disease evolves and the, for the person who was diagnosed unfortunately as time goes on the person becomes less and less aware of what's happening and then it really becomes much more difficult for the care partner um, and dementia anticipatory grief could last like in my case <laughs> it lasted 12 years mm -hmm. because it's an ever-evolving illness and so you're not only witnessing the you know the cognitive decline of the person and the fact that you can no longer communicate them but you're also constantly witnessing the physical changes that are and it's just it's it's this constant so is is dementia very different from let's say other illnesses for which you 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 help families navigate through i th i think that every illness and every challenge has its own unique path and journey but I, but recognizing and acknowledging what you just said, the fact that it is not this one uh, event or one time feeling that it is absolutely going to change over time as you have significant losses in, in, in the relationship as you knew it, in the connection that you had with the family member. So you're constantly grieving. And, and grieving differently, which is why it's so important that we talk about anticipatory grief and recognize that it is a normal part of the process for somebody who is experiencing the illness themselves and for the family members. Is it different than another kind of, uh, it, it, I guess it changes the, the, the uniqueness of dementia and anticipatory grief is what you identified, is the, is the constant changing as the illness progresses. Mm -hmm. What I hear the most, I mean, I, I live this myself, but what I hear the most from family members, whether it be spouses or children, it's really the loss of communication. It's that loss of that intimate relationship, not only physical, but it's that communication to be able to, you know, especially during times of COVID, the spouses who are sitting down for meals and no longer able to have those conversations, you know, the two-way discussions right. and the acknowledgement. You know, I remember, I remember with bringing my kids to see my mom and her no longer really recognizing or understanding them or just being able to, as a daughter, sit down with her mom and share my life with her and what was going on. There was no exchange. And I, I think for a lot of people, that's that's very, very difficult. 
So you raise a really important point. I think that what I have seen and understand is that, um, and, and spoken with different clients that have spoken about, they love their partner, but the love changes from a, a, a romantic love that they had to a, I love a caregiving type of love and I'm going to support you. But yes, the whole dynamic of the relationship has changed because it's not a give and take anymore because the person with dementia doesn't have the capacity to have those kinds of conversations anymore. So that's another loss that you're experiencing. So of course you love the person, but the love, the type of love, the type of relationship changes and, if, and there, there's another loss. And I think we need to recognize that. So before I get into some of the coping skills that you have outlined, what have you seen? I mean, we have, we have, we talked a little bit about this last year with COVID, but how has COVID had an impact on the way that people have been able to to grieve the loss of a loved one? Yeah, I I call COVID the pandemic of grief. Uh, and the, the whole it, it's already difficult to we live in a society that is not comfortable talking about difficult topics which is why i love what mcgill care does <laughs> thank you for doing that um and and so here you are trying to process and navigate your grief your anticipatory grief and then on top of it you have this covid thing this covid experience where you have another sense of all those uh, uh stages that i talked about that denial that first that we had about is covid really uh oh it's it, that thing it's not going to last then oh my gosh it's lasting and now i've lost my job i've lost this i've lost my ability to connect with other people so that's your anger and then uh bargaining okay i'll do this i'll do this for two weeks three weeks four weeks but then it's we're going to be done right we're going to be fine yeah no so then the sadness that sets in around um the fact that this is really lasting and this is really serious and people are dying all around me and I cannot see my loved ones and it's not safe. So you had that sadness and then the acceptance, I hope we came to find is how to navigate within the context of a COVID society, a COVID world, quite frankly. So it's really a double whammy of all that you've lost and continue to lose with the person and then COVID making it even more complicated mm -hmm. as uh, we try and navigate COVID within mm -hmm. this is the, uh, the, your, your life circumstances. I've seen COVID cause a tremendous amount of isolation among people. And so, you know, people are not, aren't able to get out there and even just talk about their feelings. You know, people, I know people who are still, especially of an older generation, you know, afraid to have their friends come over for a coffee mm -hmm. or even go for a walk. You know, there's been, um, you know, those those day programs, for example, where people right. would go to and, and just be, have that social stimulation that's not there, right? So, you know, the, the people that they were used to sharing and, 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 and exchanging their emotions, what they're not doing. And I think even though, you know, now that they're talking about people being vaccinated and it's maybe safe to go back out there, a lot of people are saying, well, I'm never doing that again. I'm never going to a ball. I'm never going to a cocktail. I'm never doing that again. So I guess there's a sense of grief too, saying that part of my life as I knew it, I'm not going back to it. But, and, and, and there's no question that the whole experience is, it's a bit of a vicious circle in order to stay safe we needed to isolate what's the worst possible thing anyone can do seniors for sure is that isolation is that lack of connection to other people we we are social beings we need that so it's certainly put vulnerable people in a very very precarious position and 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 now you know, i see it i see it with even my parents people that are afraid or fearful of going out going places so yeah the world has changed and even though i i'd like to think we're seeing a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccinations and doing a little bit doing more there's mm -hmm. it's it, it, we're not the same you and i were talking about this earlier that mm -hmm. i really worry about the mental health of everyone coming out of this because there's a lot of fear a lot of fear it's all uncertainty and uncertainty makes us uncomfortable so let me ask you then one of the other questions that I was going to go to later on was really about how does anticipatory grief affect children? Like what's the difference between children and teens versus adults? Well, uh, because children in process, this is a whole other discussion, but because, but I'm glad you're asking because children are often the forgotten grievers and I, I, there is not enough services. I'll say it right out there for mm -hmm. anticipatory grief and children, certainly working on that 
because um, we we don't we want to protect our kids, so we don't talk to them. But I work with kids that their parents or grandparents have significant illnesses and they don't understand and what do kids have magical thinking so they think clearly that something they did might have affected it or what do we do we let it let them figure it out on their own what by not talking to them they make up very elaborate stories about how and what and what's going on so we need to be talking to them developmentally appropriate I'm not less is more you don't have to give tons of information to a child but something so that they don't they're not left to their own devices about how to figure out what's going on. I, I did recently work with two girls whose whose mom had ALS, but they knew nothing or very little about what was going on in the process. And I really encouraged the family. I, it was not my uh, uh, role to explain it, but and it had, I wanted the permission of the family, but to really let them feel like this is, like I said, a grand opportunity to have conversations that they might not have otherwise had, given that they know what may, uh, that the, the time is limited together. So it's about giving information, not too much information, mm-hmm. at an age appropriate level for the children, involving them as much as um they partly want to because i think it's more choice than it is about deciding for them they're too young to be involved and like age of reason five and older um, where they really can somewhat be involved in in uh in the understanding and and being part of connecting with the person who is uh either diagnosed or is ill otherwise they're going to um grow up with the fears of <laughs> death and dying yeah. and uh and we know from working at a uh, a grief camp and and uh, creating that we know that um children who get the proper support uh t- tend to have far less risk taking behavior as they get older so there's a, a direct correlation and i will say uh, pr- proper support is for everybody i know mm-hmm. that it's okay to reach out for help mm-hmm. So which leads me to one of my last questions is how do people, how can people best cope with anticipatory grief? What are, what, what do we need to do? I think we need to start by acknowledging that anticipatory grief is a thing and that we can find the ways for us that are either, as long as they're not illegal, immoral, or dangerous. I say find ways like uh, journaling or um, some people meditation, some people do uh, cope through art just as a way of um, calming their nervous system. I would say seek out groups that uh, exist. There are some and Claire uh, yourself know of uh, some support groups because it's really very validating to be in mm-hmm. a group. I've had the privilege of facilitating caregiver support groups and I see Mm -hmm. firsthand how important they are yeah the Um, power of knowing you're not alone I find that's 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 what I appreciate the most about these support groups is just to know you're not alone you're not alone in your feelings and emotions and it's kind of like that aha like oh my gosh you too you're angry you too you're depressed you too you want to just punch a wall (laughs) you know right Like there's good days and bad days and tough days right. and, and all and all that's for sure. I also want to uh, highlight the fact that uh, having anticipatory grief is not giving up on the person. It doesn't mean that because you're grieving, you've already given up and said, okay, well, there's nothing more I can do. No, it's recognizing that it is a difficult time in everyone's life, but now I can focus on supporting and caring and loving and I can shift my energy to what needs to be done. Um, to help make this process as painless and, and uh, loving as, as possible. And then that means reflecting on the time that uh, the loved one does have, both for that person and for the family. You mentioned it before, communication. Communication is very important. While grief is very different for everyone, I think we need to keep the lines of communication open with family members and have the tough discussions as much as you can. If you need help, seek out help to have those discussions. The other thing that I throw out there and everyone's like, ah, oh, self-care. Never mm-hmm. underestimate. I know we throw out that term a lot, but it is very important. You cannot help anyone else if you don't help yourself. You've heard mm-hmm. the old adage, 
you put the oxygen mask on yourself first on, in an emergency mm -hmm. on an airplane before because you need to help yourself first. So please don't mm -hmm. forget that you need, it is not being selfish, it's taking care of yourself. Um, look for all kinds of support systems, not only uh, support groups, but people like Claire, who we are, is so mm -hmm. fantastic at helping people. Not Asking for help is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign mm -hmm. of strength. And um, I, I think that uh, if you need counseling, going and looking for counseling, there are a lot of good people out there that can help um, to process your emotions. And um, and uh, and and not be afraid. Not be afraid. It, it is a scary experience, but that doesn't mean that it, you have to do it alone. I always say, to people, no one gets no one gets a prize for the, being the best griever. I, th I think what I keep trying to remind, remind myself along my my own journey, and especially when I work with families who are caring for somebody with dementia, is just really try to embrace everything they still can do. You know, yes. I mean, there's there's so many ways of living well with dementia, or just even ourselves. You know, when we do get a certain news that could even affect our own health, I think I think the power of positive thinking, as difficult as it may be at times, just mm -hmm. to look at everything that we still can do and stop stop i guess reminiscing about everything we can't do you know right. and and i think also working with a lot of care partners it's always about oh well they used to be able to do this they can't do that anymore why are they doing it this way and just we have to finally let it go and you know as my as we all go through our own journeys in life it's it's easy to just be in a place where you're saying oh i used to be able to do this i used to be able to do that i can't do it anymore as opposed to saying look what i can do look what right. i you know and yeah. i think that's that's really that's kind of like my wake up call on a day to day sometimes when I go, oh my God, look what I used to, I can't do anymore, That's but right. look what I still can do, right? Yeah, um, well, it's acknowledging, and I will never say, you know, if I said feelings aren't right or wrong, they just are. So it's acknowledging that you can be sad. It is, a, 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 let's grieve, let's grieve those changes, those unwelcome changes. But that's not the only story we can tell ourselves. We can also, at the same time, we can also, as, as we're grieving the losses and the changes, we can also celebrate all that we still have because doing just staying in one place doesn't, doesn't change anything. But making the most out of the time that you have, may, I, I think, makes all the difference. Well, Corey, you know, thank you so much for being with us today. You know, I love your radio show with Matt Del Vecchio every Saturday at 3 p.m. on CJAD 800 AM in Montreal. Um, that people could tune in anywhere. And it's really, it's truly life unrehearsed. You know, the topics, it's truly about living a life that is just so unrehearsed, right? So thank you so much for having me. It's uh, always a treat to talk to you, Claire. And I look forward to having you on our show. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. Once again, I would like to thank the Zeller Family Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to join our mailing list to be notified of upcoming episodes of McGill Cares, as well as other important programs and resources from, from us, you can sign up at the McGill Cares webcast tab on our website, or you can email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Thank you for watching. <laughs>